A sinister discovery in the New Mexico desert. Are these the remains of a human sacrificed to appease angry gods? Join us as we enter a sacred city built by a people called the Anasazi, the Ancient Ones. Today, most of the world's population lives in cities, surrounded by a man-made environment. But modern civilization rests on the shoulders of a far more ancient time, a time that speaks to us only through weather-beaten ruins and legends handed down from generation to generation. Following the evidence of these oral stories back to their roots turns the historian into an explorer. This is the Four Corners region of the American Southwest, given that name by the white man because four states meet here, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico. But to the native people, this is the land of the Anasazi, the ancient ones. They are long gone, yet it is said their spirits are still a powerful presence here. In the fall of 1897, a rancher named Richard Wetherill was lured deep into this remote and barren land by a story about the Anasazi. His fascination with the Ancient Ones had begun 10 years before and hundreds of miles away. Looking for cattle which had strayed from a grazing herd, he had made a staggering find. The cliff dwellings at Mesa Verde in Colorado. These spectacular buildings and the artifacts they contained were concrete evidence of a highly accomplished civilization which had simply disappeared. Later, Wetherill found similar sites in Utah and Arizona. But all these places were, so the legend said, dwarfed by something far more spectacular. Wetherill was looking for a fabled city older, bigger, and richer than anything found so far. He had no maps, no specific directions, just the stories and a Navajo guide he hoped he could trust. The deeper they traveled into the desert, the more challenging their quest became. How could this dry and empty land ever have supported anything more than small roaming groups? Sometimes belief is rewarded. On an autumn afternoon in October 1897, Wetherill and his guide entered a deep canyon and stepped into the past. They had discovered an ancient hidden world. They had found themselves surrounded by buildings the likes of which they had never seen, never imagined possible in this land. Freestanding buildings, some as tall as five stories. One building alone, which became known as Pueblo Bonito, contained more than 650 rooms. 200 yards wide, but 15 miles long, Chaco Canyon is the site of a dozen massive complexes. They include over 300 enormous, perfectly round pits. What was their purpose? Walls are covered with mysterious paintings, carvings, signs, and symbols. 
What do they mean? What extraordinary stories do they tell? Nothing found before or after in all of North America equals or even rivals Chaco. Wetherill and the archaeologists who followed him were astounded and entranced by the pottery they found, the weapons, the tools, the jewelry, artifacts of every kind. They are abundant and they are works of art. The Chacoan people clearly created one of the great cultures of the ancient Americas. They had a diverse society, many specializations such as pottery and basket weaving, ritual specialists. We already know enough about these people to know that one of the special things about the Chacoan phenomenon is that they created a brilliant civilization of art and all the things that go with it. The Anasazi were fascinated by the heavens. They were sophisticated watchers of the sky. Many believe these thousand-year-old markings record a spectacular astronomical event, a supernova. A supernova is an exploding star way out in the galaxy. But for a month or two, that single star can outshine the other 200 billion stars of the galaxy. And there's evidence from Chinese and Japanese records that on July 4th, 1054, a spectacular new star appeared. The crescent moon indicates the supernova's position in the sky. The handprint marks it as a sacred site. What was the religious significance of the sky for these ancient people? Wetherill also made a grisly and disturbing discovery. In a small room, he uncovered a mass grave containing 14 skeletons. Each is covered with exquisite turquoise jewelry. One of the figures is draped with more than 4,000 pieces of the semi-precious stone. He is almost certainly a man of high-ranking status. The other 13 are women, and the evidence is clear. They did not die natural deaths. Wetherill's wife, Marietta, visited the site and speculated about the violence and its meaning. The skeletons of 13 women were lying against the wall, clear around the room, and every one had a hole in their skulls. They were his wives, perhaps, to go to the afterlife with him. The Diary of Marietta Wetherill, 1897. There are other burial sites in Chaco Canyon, but none like this one. An even larger question baffled Wetherill. Twenty million years ago, Chaco Canyon lay beneath a great inland sea. But when the water receded, only a dry and desolate desert remained. Mesopotamia, Egypt, a number of others, uh, China. All of those are, are complex societies founded in a very arid region. But the key to those places is they have major river systems. We just don't have the water here. Water is critical. Without a great body of water to support it, how had this civilization flourished? Why did the ancient ones build here at all? The canyon walls provided the stone for the buildings, but where did the wood come from? Archaeologists estimate construction required timber from a quarter of a million trees. But today, the landscape is totally barren. Samples taken from the beams indicate that the trees were not local. Most came from as far as 50 miles away. There, stone axes alone were used to cut and trim them. 
The Chaco people didn't have horses or oxen or wheeled carts to haul the timber here. Archaeologists have calculated that the Anasazi were only here from about 900 to 1250 AD. Yet with ingenuity and determination, they mastered their environment to create magnificent monuments of wood and stone. Above all, the Anasazi lived in harmony with the landscape. In their stories, the land itself was seen as holy. Yet there is no question that the people who once lived at one with this land are long gone. What happened to them? Did some single terrible calamity drive them from their city? Where did they go? A snake may seem an object of horror and fear, but for Native Americans, snakes can have a magical power. In 1925, a photographer was permitted to enter a Hopi Indian settlement in northern Arizona. It was a rare opportunity to capture something never filmed before or since. Rights little changed since the days of the Ancient Ones. The dancers carry venomous snakes, which could easily twist and strike with deadly effect. While dancing with the snakes in their mouths, the Hopi affirm their oneness with nature and the earth. One line of dancers represent antelope, whose galloping feet produce a sound like thunder when a herd races across the land. But the clouds must be induced to release their rain, because snakes spend their lives so close to the earth they and they alone have the power to draw down the rain. Rain is the key that unlocks one of Chaco's greatest riddles. The Anasazi were a wandering people, nomads who lived off the land. Then a thousand years ago, they stopped wandering and began building here in this parched and barren land. Why? The puzzle was solved by a new scientific technique, dendrochronology, the study of the tree rings in the timber used at Chaco. They provided a startling revelation. About a thousand years ago, the weather changed an era of record rains began. That wet period in the 900s allowed things to happen for these folks. And it could have been, given the psyche of human populations, maybe it was wet enough and maybe for the first time they sur saw surpluses that they could never, had never imagined before. Until this moment in their history, the Anasazi had depended on hunting and the gathering of whatever wild plants they could find. Now they could be farmers. Now they could grow corn, squash, beans, a dependable and abundant food supply. The ancient ones of Chaco Canyon began to build an irrigation system to capture and control this gift of nature. Their tools were primitive, but they built monumentally. How were they able to do it? Perhaps the Anasazi drew on a resource more powerful than mere physical strength. One of the things that my grandma used to tell me in accomplishing major tasks is that a community has to be whole. Everything was done for the betterment of the community. They put their heart and soul in, into these projects. I feel that there was a lot of the spirits and the guidance from a higher being. There was such a high level of spirituality in Chaco at the time. It's really not um, difficult for me to, to believe that uh, a lot of that had, had to do with the preciseness of these structures and 
their concept of、uh, time frame. That if it took a year to build a structure, then that's what it took. The Anasazi left no written records, only the haunted ruins, the cryptic imagery, and tales told by the old to the young. How reliable are these stories? It was an old legend about a magnificent city that had brought Weatherill here in the first place, and it was another that led archaeologists to an astounding discovery. It was said that the ancient ones had an immense road system. Archaeologists found nothing more than short, narrow paths. Apparently, a story exaggerated in the telling. Then, sophisticated new techniques of aerial observation allowed scientists to see beneath the surface. A vast network of roads, long obscured by sand and silt, suddenly appeared. We know that the canyon itself was the heart. Of a world that stretched out towards the four quarters, with long, straight ceremonial roadways that run out to so-called Chaco outliers, 30 or 40 miles away in many cases. But why were they so wide? Some were 40 feet across, as broad as a modern city street. Some were carved into the sheer vertical cliffs of the canyon. As excavations proceeded, archaeologists began to wonder what kind of city they had uncovered. With so many structures, why were so few bodies buried here? Only about 700 skeletons have been discovered, most of them inside the smaller houses. And the archaeologists were. Surprised that there weren't very many burials in comparison with excavating small house sites that are basically domestic habitations, and they said, "Wow, there's something, there's something really strange." And they didn't key into the fact that, of course, it's strange. These are public buildings. If we were to excavate a library or a post office or a courthouse in our society, we wouldn't find very many human remains. Other evidence as to the true identity of these buildings may lie buried just outside the canyon. Covering just over two acres, Pueblo Alto is smaller than Pueblo Bonito, but it has yielded new insight into the real purpose of the so-called great houses. As often happens at archaeological sites. The trash heap proved to be a valuable record, covering close to a quarter of an acre. It represents a hundred years' worth of refuse. More than 200,000 pieces of pottery have been found in the mound. Smaller shards indicate that there once may have been as many as a million pottery pieces. The vast number of pots far exceeds the needs of the estimated population. What could this mean? The answer was suggested by the fact that the trash was not deposited evenly; the layers are of different thickness. There's probably some kind of ritual thing happening there at Chaco, where people come together, maybe once a year or something like that. They have ceremonies or some kind of event there, and then the stuff they bring with them, they they throw away or leave there, maybe intentionally broken. And left in the trash midden. We may never know what really took place here, but many scholars believe that it was a spiritual center, where worship and ritual were the dominant activities. For the Anasazi, religion and nature were inextricably intertwined. The earth and the sky were held in reverence. The sun itself is important. We call it father. We call the moon father as well. We call Earth mother. 
and they're like the parents of the people that occupy Chaco Canyon. When people move around a lot, as these people originally did, and are nomads, they look at the nighttime sky. It's the one consistent element of their world as they move. But when people settle down, as these people did, now you can watch the daytime sky and you understand very quickly that cycle of the sun, which creates for you a yearly arena in which to play out your life so that you can predict when to plant, you can predict when the light is going to almost leave the world and when it's going to return so that you know everything is unfolding as it's supposed to. Of the many images at Chaco, none appears more frequently than the spiral. Some are tightly coiled, others loosely drawn, but all seem to be essential elements of a profound system giving spiritual meaning to the physical world. The spiral etched into the magnificent Fajada Butte is part of an ingenious mechanism for tracking the movement of father-son. It is located behind three enormous stone slabs. Every year, at the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, a shaft of light begins to crawl across the spiral at sunrise. Then, around noon, it happens. A streak known as the sun dagger slices directly through the center of the spiral. A central event of Anasazi life, the full ascendancy of father-son, has been marked. The calendar is secure. The cycle of life will prevail. Mother Earth will continue to produce. In this place, haunted by the remains of a vanished past, the enormous subterranean chambers called kivas may seem ominous and threatening. But for the ancient ones, they were the place where the sky spoke to the people. In Anasazi architecture, at Chaco Canyon, for example, many of the great kivas particularly reflect their knowledge of astronomy. And we think the circular shape reflects the view of the heavens is almost the bowl of the night sky. We also think that certain windows existed to let the sunlight in in the mornings and in the evenings and shine on the wall and produce a kind of a dance or pattern that they can interpret and monitor the annual cycle. Of all the kivas, the one called Casa Rinconada is the largest and most elaborate it is also the most intact. The roofs and upper structures of most kivas have long since collapsed. At Casa Rinconada, it is still possible to experience the dance of the sun once a year. Here at sunrise on that longest day, June 21st, a magical moment occurs. It is an event that has played out on these silent stones for nearly a thousand years. The dawn light pierces the kiva through a small window at the top, painting a golden rectangle on the wall opposite. Slowly, the shaft of light crawls along the stony face to illuminate one niche that receives no light at any other time of the year. You can imagine the darkened interior of this enclosed underground kiva, like a great silo, and the priests and other people waiting in the darkness for the dawn and the light of the midsummer sun shining through the window and illumining a niche that probably contains some image I think we'll never know what it was. The kiva is a place of living wonder. For many, this is where the spirit of Chaco is strongest. For 250 years, a civilization flourished here. 
But finally, a time came when the gods were angry, a time when the land was robbed of its most precious gift, the rain. 1150 to 1170, very, very bad drought. And it looks like, because I would say there's a major depopulation of Chaco Canyon. Each one of those successively seems to be one of the worst they've seen you know, for hundreds and hundreds of years. The great era of rain, which had allowed the birth of Chaco, began to falter and then gave way to relentless drought. For people who believe themselves personally bound to nature, even drought must have meaning. If you anger the gods or the spirits that hold the rain, then they would just withdraw that privilege. We're told that if we go into a ceremony, if we go into an activity without our whole mind, body, and soul, then our prayers might not be answered. There was constant need to placate the gods. Rituals passed down from ancient times, as captured in this rare film, suggest what may have happened. During this Hopi rain ceremony, the clans gather to compete in sacred games, much as the ancient Greeks held Olympics to honor their gods. Members of the snake and antelope clans race barefoot across the desert and up the mesa. When they finish the grueling race, the runners are rewarded with a jar of water. It began as a holy rite, but as the years passed, did the people of Chaco develop too great a pride in winning? Did they lose their connection with the spirit world? It's almost impossible for the mass to make that connection. But if one individual within that mass can make that connection, then because of that one individual, nobody knows who that individual is. But if one individual can make that true connection, then the spirits that reward uh, such efforts will reward the Pueblo with, with, with rain. Could it be that a holy man of the Ancient Ones failed in his duty? Perhaps that is the explanation for the mysterious grave, the one great man and the 13 murdered women. Were they a sacrifice? an attempt to atone for angering the gods. It is possible that as the drought tightened its grip and food became scarce, the social order collapsed. Could this have precipitated murder? We know that some of the, um, the, the burials in the great houses, some of the people appear to have been killed, whether ritually or otherwise. They, they, have, they have, their skulls are, are smashed and they have broken, broken legs. The precise sequence of events is lost, but it is certain that the rains failed, the crops withered, and slowly over time, the people left Chaco Canyon. It could no longer sustain them. The Anasazi, the ancient ones, were forced to leave their paradise. But this was not the end of their story. To many Native Americans who live near Chaco, pictures on the canyon walls called anthropomorphs are records of the distant past. They are believed to document the beginnings of the Anasazi who originated underground. I've had Pueblo peoples tell me that uh, when they see the anthropomorphs, for instance, they'll occasionally say, well, that's when we had tails. Uh, that's when we lived in the earlier worlds, and we were of a different form then. To the religious of all faiths and cultures, humans and gods communicate, and events have a meaning far richer than mechanical cause and effect. Perhaps the gods always intended that the people leave Chaco. 
once they got up on top, they started migrating in a southerly direction. And Chaco Canyon was about one of the stops in this migration route. We are in a journey. We've been on a journey since our ancestors came up through, through the underworld. Our journey isn't built on just a hundred years or a thousand years. There's, there's no time frame. I don't know where the journey is going to end. The Chaco people did not vanish. It is now generally agreed that the Hopi, the Zia, the Zuni, and the other Pueblo people are direct descendants of the ancient ones. The Navajo may not be. They seem to have arrived in the area long after the Anasazi left. But Anasazi is a Navajo word, and some scholars regret having taken it up. It's kind of a dirty word. Uh, the, the Hopi and other Pueblo people really hate it, but it's the word that the uh, anthropologists have latched onto. It means something like the, our enemy ancestors or the enemies of our ancestors. 400 years after the ancient ones left Chaco, and well after the arrival of new tribes like the Navajo, a strange presence entered the land. Pale men with beards riding large beasts never seen before. They were to prove very dangerous, far worse than intertribal rivalry or even cataclysmic drought. It was in 1540 that the first Europeans appeared. Ironically, they were drawn to the area by a legend of seven fabulous cities filled with gold. Was it Chaco Canyon they had heard of? By a tragic twist, had the city of the Ancient Ones brought these destroyers? Treasure drew them, but also a burning zeal to save souls. The Indians were to be rescued from their pagan ways, by force if necessary. Native American holy men were tortured and killed. Ritual objects were destroyed. Native Americans were enslaved to build missions and to do other work for the white men. And there was worse, for the Europeans brought disease from their world. The Native Americans had no immunity against the scourge of smallpox and other epidemics. Plagues ravaged them, almost wiping them out. There were uprisings against the Europeans, but ultimately they failed. The great migration of the people from north to south was stopped. Among the oddest and most destructive of the ideas brought by the white man was that land could be owned, that men could make claims on Mother Earth. The authorities would impose new values and beliefs on every facet of Native American life. Their culture was suppressed. Their proud long hair was cut. It seemed as though the old ways would be lost, ties broken with the ancient ones. But it was not so. Often in secret, the rituals and the stories continued to be handed down. And Chaco Canyon remained, remote and enigmatic, a secret place haunted by the spirits of the ancient ones.
We live now by the clock. Hours and minutes dominate, not the position of the sun and the stars. Modern life has torn the web connecting us with nature. Gentle, deep rhythms of life so long observed are now ignored. But Native American tradition has always maintained the connection with nature. If you're gonna go hunting, you have hunting spirits. If you're, you're, you're dancing for rain, you have spirits uh, that assist you in, in, in uh, making those things happen. If you're gonna compose a song, it's not something that you as an individual were able to compose. It's the spirits giving you the ideas to be able to compose the song. For the descendants of the Anasazi, Chaco Canyon is a place where that timeless connection with nature endures. For modern scientists, on the other hand, Chaco Canyon remains an intriguing detective story. Why were its roads 40 feet wide? How was the timber from a quarter of a million trees brought here by people lacking horses or oxen or carts? What is the meaning of the sacrifice of the 13 women? Why is there so much evidence of violence in what otherwise seems to have been a peaceful world? The search for answers to these and other historical puzzles requires the digging up of graves and other sacred sites. But for many Native Americans, this is sacrilege. We will go to those locations. We ask permission to be there on site. We ask for forgiveness of those people that have gone before us and have excavated on site. Then we ask the spirits to continue to be the givers of good and to be the givers of life. This spot may have significance that's beyond our understanding. It might have had to do with one group of people comes here and something good happens to them. And then there, th this place retains uh, a value that's beyond what it does. The value doesn't um, preserve in the dirt, you might say. We can't dig it up and say, oh, they're here because of this. Should Chaco be treated as an archeological site or a place of living worship? How much disturbance is tolerable? Where should the line be drawn? I feel that it's disrespectful to just allow anybody to answer enter Casa Rinconada at any time. And only in the right frame of mind are people supposed to answer. Entering a kiva is significant to journeying back to the underworld where we originated. And that in itself is an activity that we don't hold lightly. The people believe they were born deep inside the earth. In time, they came to the surface, took human form, and began their great historic migration to the south. They paused at Chaco Canyon, built a great civilization, and then moved on. Modern life and modern rules block the way, but for those with faith, the journey will resume. Who knows, maybe another thousand years, there isn't gonna be an Albuquerque or a Rio Rancho. And at that point in time, you know, we'll be able to continue our journey. One day, the remnants of the modern age will be the last evidence of a vanished civilization. One that will challenge the archeologists of the future to take their own journey in search of history.